This episode of A Glass Blower's Companion is brought to you by Mountain Glass Arts. For the month of December 2019, Mountain Glass has a couple sales. Right now they have their special sale, their sec- uh, select seconds 50% off. Special sale, select seconds 50%, 50% if I can say, say that five times fast. Right now they have uh, select Boro, uh, Northstar, and Troutman seconds at 50% off. Uh, no coupon code needed. Get these seconds while they are still in stock. Uh, they also have their Glass Alchemy's Classic Firsts, 30% off sale. And again, no coupon code needed. Just go through uh, Mountain Glass's selection of the Glass Alchemy Classics and you'll find what is still available. And for all you beautiful soft glass nerds, they have their Double Helix, 15% off. All you have to do is use the code HELIX, H-E-L-I-X, at checkout and you'll save 15% off Double Helix. And don't forget to check out their weekly sales as well as their kiln sales, torch sales, and everything else going on at Mountain Glass. Also, Mountain Glass is officially open on the West Coast. They are over there in Eugene, Oregon. They are open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, to check Eugene stock or for Eugene pickup orders, just please call their Asheville number at 866-LAMPWORK. And I'll have all that information in the show notes. In the meantime, go to mountainglass.com for any more information. That's mountainglass.com. This episode is also brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Have your art featured in The Flow Magazine's Spring 2020 Nature Issue. The Spring 2020 Issue of The Flow Magazine will explore the wonders of nature, everything from the tiniest microbes, marine animals, and wildlife to global environments, including geological formations, plants and trees, and bodies of water, large and small. Gallery entries, general interest stories, and health, safety, or technical articles, plus tutorials are welcomed. Any skill level submissions from beginner and intermediate to advanced are accepted for consideration for beads, sculptures, marbles, paperweights, vessels, and mixed media. They look forward to hearing from you. Please email three to five high resolution digital images of your art that are at least 300 DPI along with submission forms to Maureen James at The Flow Magazine. I'll have her email in the uh, information here in the show notes for you guys. This is a great way for you to get your work published into a magazine. And as far as I understand now, The Flow has officially gone digital uh, with the up uh, cost in printing and paper. Uh, It's going to be more affordable for them to not only continue to operate as a company, but to grow as well uh, by making this a a completely uh, just online digital media. Um, I believe there are some talks that if you want to have it done in paper, that it's possible to have it done, but I don't hold me to that. I think they're really just going to strictly hold themselves to becoming uh, just a digital online magazine. Uh, nowadays, with all of us on our phones and tablets and computers and everything else, uh, it's a little easier uh, for us to access their uh, articles and stuff. And again, it's going to help them cut costs so that they can continue to grow. Uh, they've taken over the webinar series that Glasscraft used to do, and they're now uh, continuing those le- webinar series online. So any kind of tutorials, any lessons that you can think of, uh, there is a shit ton of information out there. So again, go to theflowmagazine.com. You can still save 10% on your uh, annual subscription if you have not yet subscribed to their magazine. Just use promo code WISEGUY. And I'll have all the information and links in the show notes for you to submit all of your work to uh, The Flow Magazine for their Spring 2020 Nature Issue. And again, go to theflowmagazine.com. Hey, what's happening? Welcome to A Glass Blower's Companion, Episode 8. How are you? I hope your holidays are going well and you had a happy Thanksgiving if you're living here in the United States. Uh, otherwise, I uh, hope you're staying warm in your studios because it is getting chilly out there. Even down here in old, sunny, shiny Florida, it's been uh, pretty chilly here, even though it was like 85 the day, but it's up and down. That's one reason why us Floridians down here are always sick because it's hot one day. And it's cold the next, and then it's hot for five days, and then it's cold for four days. It is annoying. 
Uh, but today's a special episode. We have Eli Maze making a return. Uh, his last uh, episode he was on was 177, where he shared his origins, uh, some insights into the American shot glass and the history of the shot glass, which was really fascinating. And uh, him and I, behind the scenes, have been chit-chatting about uh, some future episodes, uh, really covering uh, a lot of historical aspects in glass. Uh, we talk about in this episode, which is kind of intriguing to me, too, is uh, that this industry that we're in, the, the pipe industry, uh, for those that are not pipe artists or just glass artists in general, uh, glass has been around for centuries. Uh, but the pipe industry itself has really been growing over the last, say, 30 years. Uh, I've been in this industry now since 99. Uh, I consider myself to be an overall glass artist. The fact that I do work over at Disney and have the opportunity to create works of art there. Uh, and I don't have to do pipes on a full-time basis, even though I still am a piper at heart. And I still love this community and seeing the growth and want to help you guys out there. Um, but in general, this uh, this industry has been around for roughly about 30 years. And Eli and I get into a conversation uh, talking about some of the origins of the histories, uh, which basically stems back to his documentary that him and Joaquin uh, together produced and uh, have released uh, called... <laughs> <clears throat> called Pipe Town USA, uh, which is basically the origins of the pipe industry and, and, the, and the foundation starting back with Bob Snodgrass. Um, their initial focus when they first started talking about this documentary was just to strictly focus and do a documentary on Bob Snodgrass. But they really both together understood that this community is uh, more vast than just a singular person. And Bob himself even recognizes that and, and, and talks about that in his uh, chit chat. Um, but Bob is still instrumental into, uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, setting a foundation for this industry and for the pipe culture. Um, not only with just the way of life, because this all a lot of this all started on the Dead Tour and selling your art and your wares on the Dead Tour, uh, which then led to the Dead Tour stopping and they needed a place to sell their glass, so they started hitting retail stores and uh, etc. Uh, but the culmination of one person starting a little thing that has grown into what it is now—it's incredible. But there hasn't been a lot of history covered in this industry. Unlike other <clears throat> industries out there, uh, there's a lot of history that's been written, whether it's the farming or the uh, you know an agriculture or the uh, industrial industry, you know all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that being said, uh, Eli and I behind the scenes have been talking the the importance for us to start documenting, and he has been documenting through books. Again, starting off back with the uh, American Shot Glass and just the Shot Glass, his two books he's got out. Um, and then uh, him and Joaquin together came and started uh, collaborating and thinking about some ideas. And uh, Joaquin had a bunch of uh, past footage from stuff he was doing through Glasscraft, which uh, if you haven't listened to his episode yet, he was back on episode six, I believe. Um, him sharing his story and his journey uh, into getting involved in this community. Uh, but anyways, long story short, uh, Pipe Town USA does cover the origins. Uh, and it goes up to a certain time period. I mean, it comes up to modern time. Uh, but there's such a vast amount of artists and origins that we all come from uh, that, again, Eli and I have talked about the ideas of starting to create some kind of timeline, family tree, historical type of thing. Uh, so look for from future episodes uh, that I'm going to be putting, talking about and putting some posts out because uh, ideally uh, I do want to start creating a family tree. I think it'd be fun to start off with old, old Snodgrass and start with him and branch out and really see uh, where we all come from. I know myself personally, uh, I learned from Daniel Sharp, my pipe techniques. Uh, some of my basic fundamentals I learned from him. He was up in uh, South Fulton County up in Georgia. Uh, Daniel learned from Sky. Sky learned from Bob Stagrass, I believe is how that works. Um, and uh, I don't know Sky's last name. I know him and his wife at one point in time were up in Gainesville, Florida, I believe. And they had a school bus. Um, some of those that, that of you might know him, uh, would, I would love to find out. Uh, those that do, reach out to me. Let me know. Um, I'll have my email in the show notes, um, or you can just hit me up on Instagram at the Glass Blowers Companion, or just Glass Blowers Companion on Instagram. Uh, send me a DM, because um, again, I, ideally, it's it's going to take a long time to do this, and with anything that's done well, it takes a long time, uh, including this documentary. Um, but just on a side note, I would love uh, to begin, and Eli is the same way. We both want to kind of start this kind of concept of creating a family tree. Um, but that being said, uh, I've watched Pipe Town USA several times, and I've gotten a lot of different things out of it, a lot of amazing quotes, and, and just seeing the inspiration and the influence that has come 
through the generations of Glass. Uh, this this documentary doesn't just cover the OGs. Uh, it covers also some other artists that are newer that have been behind the torch maybe three to five years. And it's, it's really fascinating. But what I do enjoy the most out of this is that it comes from the perspective of Joaquin, who uh, is the one who's uh, more or less documenting this, this footage and uh, this story. <clears throat> the artists, and including Eli, who are being interviewed and talking in this sh- in the documentary, um, are sharing their stories and sharing their knowledge, uh, but they're sharing it to Joaquin. And Joaquin asks some questions and ha- asks some pretty hard-hitting questions uh, that reveal some things that some of these artists may have never shared with anybody before, which I think is pretty awesome. So uh, definitely hope you en- definitely enjoy this interview and this, ch- this talk with me and Eli. Uh, we do kind of go all over the, over the place, not just focusing on Pipe Town USA, but the core of this is about Pipe Town USA. And uh, if you want to go back and listen to our, my interview with Joaquin and hear his origins and how he got involved in this project, uh, starting back with Dave Winship and Glasscraft and doing the, uh, the demonstration or the uh, online tutorials and the webinars that they were doing back then, and just the importance of video and, uh, and documentation as well. So, uh, yeah. Other than that, um, there's been a lot of things going on, I think. I know we got uh, Glass Vegas is coming up in January. I've been talking with them folks behind the scenes. It uh, looks like if everything is going as planned, I'm going to be up there myself. Um, I'm going to bring some merch, hopefully a couple of different things, but I'm going to mainly be there to document the trade show from a perspective of a first-time trade show person myself. And uh, the goal is to really... Uh, because 2020 is going to be a big year for this show. There's a lot of things. I, I know I've, I've said that in the past about this past year. I wasn't expecting to have to move and uh, uproot myself twice and then also meet my fiance. And it's just <laughs> 2019 was an amazing year, amazing, amazing year for progress uh, for a lot of things, not only for me as an individual and personally, but just uh, just things within just kind of some focus, I guess, with what I'm doing here. Because this does take time. I don't have a lot of time to put into this. But now that my schedule at work has changed, I now I'm working five days a week instead of four days. But my days are shorter. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm getting stuff done in the mornings before I head in. And then I'm also working during my lunch break. And I mean, literally, I'm writing every day. I had to have an hour for my lunch that I take. And um, my laptop's out. And I'm writing stuff up for, for this the content for this podcast and for the online stuff I'm going to be doing. Um, I know YouTube right now is in the middle of doing some different things and changes with their, uh, what you can post with this whole new kid thing. I, there's a name for it, which I can't remember what the hell it's called, and I should know. Uh, but there's they're getting pretty strict on making your stuff either kid-friendly or not kid-friendly. Um, so there's going to be a point in time here where eventually uh, most of the content that I'm going to be posting up on YouTube uh, will probably become private at some point in time. I'm not really sure how I'm going to work it out, but I want to make sure that you do have access to all this stuff. Um, I'll probably have access through the Patreon page. And as of right now, I have no patron, p- patrons, which I understand because I haven't been, uh, really been active in there at all. <clears throat> I got to a point to where I was being active somewhat consistently. Uh, but for those that were contributing to the show, um, I I didn't really feel like I was giving them their value. Even though this podcast is, you know, is part of what the Patreon is for to help support the show. Um, but having not posted that many podcast episodes and et cetera, I didn't really, you know, I understood why people backed out. Um, but 2020 is going to be a big focus on more content and exclusive content um, that will be accessible through the Patreon page. And it's a, for as little as a dollar a month, you'll have access to the videos and stuff. Um, the online course is still moving forward. A lot of things are happening, so I, I don't want to get into too much, but um, yeah. Yeah. I didn't take any notes for this opening, so I'm kind of just flying by the seat of my pants here. I uh, just woke up a little bit ago, and I'm about to get my day started here. Uh, my birthday is coming up. Today is the 13th, and I'm recording this, and my birthday is on the 16th. So uh, Julie has some plans for us for tonight, so I don't have a whole lot of time uh, today to work on my shop. But I will be getting some stuff done, as well as getting this out for you guys. So uh, before I keep rambling, I'm going to let you go. Hope you do enjoy this episode with Eli Maze. And again, go check out uh, Pipe Town USA. I'll have all the links in the show notes. Uh, they're going to be exposing this to the nation here pretty soon. And uh, look forward to it. So until next time, don't forget to share this show with your friends. Subscribe on iTunes if you have not yet and any other podcast catchers that you listen to. If you can please leave us a review, 
a written review and a star review would be fantastic. It just helps expose the show, shows people out there that is being listened to, including the algorithms of the hires in the podcasting uh, lore of whatever <laughs> you want to call it. It's very helpful. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you on the next episode. Take care of yourselves. Love you. Peace. What's going on, Eli? Welcome back to the show, brother. Hey there, Jason. How are you doing today? Good, man. Good. Finally got you on here again. Uh, we got Pipe Town USA that just came out. I had Joaquin on a couple, I guess, last month talking about the, his pers- uh, perspective and his uh, involvement in this film, the documentary series. Well, I guess not really a series, but the documentary of uh, Pipe Town USA covering the Eugene Glass scene and like the origins of the pipe. And uh, I was really fascinated early on, I guess like a year ago almost now, seeing the beginnings of this, you guys doing this and, and Joaquin's posts on Instagram and just the, the production side of things, which I'm always intrigued by and filming glass and whatever with my involvement, you know, creating content and stuff. And uh, got me really interested in seeing what you guys were doing and I started following along and then I reached out and uh, got a, my own personal screening of this uh, film and got to bring Joaquin on and now we got you on, man, to talk about Pipe Town USA and uh, your involvement in it, but also some kind of, uh, you know, just some talks and insights into this film. So I appreciate yeah, it. Oh, back heck on. Yeah, man. And you were back on, uh, yeah, 177 was when you were, was the last episode that you were on and here we are almost at 250. Oh my goodness. And, you know, a big shout out to you, Jason, because I, I've listened to almost every episode and something that we listen to in the shop. And it's it's something, as you know, everybody should give it a go. We've been listening to music this whole time and just rocking the music. It's just such a great perspective of glass blowers, personalities and characteristics out there that really kind of can inspire you while you're working. Yeah, man. Hell yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, so uh, last we talked, you were sharing the history of the shot glass, and I know you're, uh, you know, you still do the fairs, not well, well the Sunday market, I guess the, farm, the farmers market you're doing, <clears throat> there in your hometown, and uh, you know, you're not really a, a pipe maker, you're a glass artist in a sense, you know, and, and also you love to dig up history and uh, things behind the scenes. So I guess initially on, like, what got you inspired and, and to start sharing the story of the Eugene glass scene? Well, you know. I, I am a pipe maker. I was originally a pipe maker, and my brother worked for JBD. My brother was one of Jerome Baker Design's like star artists. And um, I had a friend from high school that also worked for JBD. And I was born and raised in Eugene, and I live only about 10 blocks from Bob Snodgrass. So... Early in my glass career, and my old, my older brother started in 1997, and I started watching him right away. And but I eventually got into it, and I learned about this guy, Bob Snodgrass. At the time, Bob had a little tool and a little supply shop at his house, and of course, you. I heard about this legend, and I looked it up in the phone book. I found Bob Snodgrass. I went over to his house. And the first thing I did was I met his apprentice, which is Hugh. Um, And Hugh is just a great guy. And it was my first interaction with Bob Snodgrass, probably in like 2000, 2001. And I went over there and I was just, I was just like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging around with this legend. It's only my first year in glass. And the guy lives right down the street from me. Yeah. And so, yeah, I was just, I was born in the right place for my you know, my career, like I, like my brother says on Pike Town, I could have been born in or, or, or lived in Wyoming and I wouldn't have had those resources with JBD, you know, Cascade, um, Sky Glass, all, Windship, Glasscraft, all these glass artists around me. And at one time in the early 2000s, Windship had 6,000 glass blowers on his mailing list just in the county around us here, Lane County. Wild. So, yeah, and that's why, you know, that's that's why this uh, film Pipe Town, you know, kind of kind of got started. I, I came up with this story as far as, you know, I, I lived down the street from this guy and watched this guy through the years. And, um, yeah, then that's kind of how I got in. What happened was me and Joaquin were shooting a little – you know, documentary, documentary slash how to make a shot glass over at Bob Snodgrass's house. 
um, a couple of years ago, that episode that we were talking about that I was on. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting there and I, of course, I wrote a book on shot glasses and started this like movement to bring back the shot glass and, and uh, told this story about the history of the shot glass and the prohibition and why we're shooting Snodgrass. He's also in my last, our, our last film that has a little interview him with. So why we're shooting him, I have this epiphany, which I'm sure many people have, have thought the same thing, but I did a little documentary and did a book. So I'm sitting here looking at Bob Snodgrass and this light pops in my head. We're doing a documentary on my book. And I'm like, it's the two prohibitions, the pipe and the shot glass. And I thought, no one's ever done a documentary on Bob Snodgrass. And immediately a light bulb came on and I knew that I was going to do this story. Hell yeah. And, and I came home and I said to Joaquin, Joaquin, this is crazy. We're going to do the Bob Snodgrass story. And we both kind of just lit up with a huge cheese smile, you know? Yeah, it's awesome. So, <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, there's, there's other people that have touched on the story. They might be from the East Coast or from Virginia or, you know, maybe in Seattle. But I felt like I really knew the story growing up and living in Eugene. And I told the story my way, even though, and with Joaquin, of course, you know, he, uh, we did it together. It was collaboration. But the cool thing was is that <clears throat> I just really felt like we had the heart of the story um, Bob Snodgrass is the one that brought me out to Las Vegas to my most successful show where I taught for 18 years, Hell you yeah. know? And yeah. so, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's so it's, so it's, it's been a miracle. Yeah. It's amazing. Man. I've, I've heard a lot of people like just through other shows I listen to and whatever, talk about the concept of like when you're born, like you could be born anywhere in the world. And the fact that you're born at this one place at this one time is, you know, it's a sense of the, the ball starts rolling for your life and then you kind of see where it takes you. And it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, you have this guy around the corner from you. It's like having the fucking Loch Ness monster or, you know, something like that. <laughs> or this legend yeah. around the corner from you that really nobody knows about, nobody believes in and does this really exist. And, you know, it's cool. And I think, you know, what's, what's interesting with, with Snodgrass is the humble nature that he has. And like, he doesn't, he, he doesn't like, you know, he's like, I'm not the guy that created the pipe. But he's definitely the the one that he you know he talks about the the accidental find of fume glass you know it's and fuming glass and fume's been on glass for s centuries but not in the sense of the functionality of how it's used and it was started to be used then. Right, and you know, you know, fuming glass, a glass vapor deposit. It's how they made the very first color TV. So yeah, you're right. They they've been fuming and, and, and you could say kind of not fuming, but, you know, doing vapor deposition and fumes would come off even in soft glass. And so that was the cool story behind this is that, yeah, they've been making pipes for 3000 years. You know, the oldest pipe they ever found was called the calabash and the calabash translates into the word gourd, which is a piece of squash that they originally smoking out of that they found in Pharaoh tombs. Yeah, that's and wild. so, yeah, and so, uh, you know, when, when Snodgrass, his pipe, that was like a guy picking up a torch and running with it. He didn't invent the pipe, but he started up, he was the one, and there was other people making pipes, he'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. But he's the one that picked up the torch and carried it. He's the one that came up with fuming, and he's the one that really was the guy that inspired our industry. And he's known, as you know, as the godfather of glass. And and And, is, and one thing that... I didn't, you know, that that I really love about this is that the exclamation mark is on this. I think you can feel me on this. I tell people he's the most influential glass artist in a hundred years. And I think about it sometime and I wonder, was he the most influential artist in a hundred years? Yeah. And maybe. I only say that because yeah. people are popping up all across the world. And having a glass blowing lamp working studio right in their backyard, backed by hundreds of billions of dollars from the cannabis industry. So it's not like you're going to go out and make thimbles and, and little frogs and all that stuff abroad and have 
this frugalist amount of money from cannabis, the prohibition that just passed hundreds of billions of dollars, just people ready to spend their money on and throw it out the window pretty much. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah, man, it's, it's like that he planted that seed, and now we've got this just worldwide phenomenon within a subculture, you know, and it's, it's, and it's like yeah. a niche within a subculture. So it's like even such a small microcosm that we all exist in. But, you know, like I talk to people at work all the time and, you know, I hear about it being a dying art, you know, and I'm always like, you know, it's not really a dying art. I'm in this big group with like 15,000 glass blowers. And they're like, well, if you think about like the population of the world, 15,000 people is not a lot of fucking people. It's still like, you know, point zero 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 one percent if that, you know, people in the world that do what we do, you know, so, right. so which is amazing to be in this culture that we're in. And not even just a pipe culture, but just the glass world in general, you know, just to say like, Hey, we fucking play with this hot, dangerous, crazy shit. Like I heard this kid of the day. He's like, mom, that's dangerous. And I'm like, yeah, I burn myself every day. <laughs> you know? Cause yeah, it's what I we do. Myself, I burn myself right before I got on here to talk to you. Just a small little burn. Yeah. That's um, all it takes. What, you know, one thing that I, that you kind of touched on there for a minute that I think we could even blow up more. This is crazy. Jason is that, you know, snodgrass fumes, the pipe, what does that do? It inspires color in borosilicate glass. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, we've got cobalt. We've got all these other colors. What was that backed by? It wasn't backed by a guy like me, uh, an industry making frogs and doing this. The cannabis industry backed the glass pipe movement. They bought glass pipes. Glass blowers were all finally having you know, uh, financial gains. What did they do? They went into making color right after that. Who supported that? The glass pipe makers. They weren't making all this color initially because guys that were making ponies and dolphins were running in saying, I need more color. I've got a $5,000, $10,000 order. So what does that transpire into? It transpires into now we have color. Oh, wow. We can make colored marbles and borosilicate glass. We can make color pendants. It was because of Bob Snodgrass that everybody's making colored marbles. Everybody's making colored pendants. It was him that inspired color makers like, you know, North Star and all these other places to say, hey, we got to make some color for these pipe makers, blowing up a whole new industry and a whole new um, artistic movement. Yeah, 100%. 100%. So. Yeah, and so it's it's exciting, you know, because sometimes people don't articulate it right, and they don't put the story together right. And so I felt like through the years of doing, like I said, my book and this and that, living around all these glass blowers, also being at the Saturday market. So I've been at the Saturday market here in Eugene for 20 years. If you come to Eugene, I mean, people will say, "Oh, there's a guy down there on the courthouse. He's been there for 20 years." Well, that's why Bob Snodgrass partially moved to Eugene. And so there's another connection there between, you know, m my family and Bob's because we grew up at the Saturday market too. And it was kind of a direct result from him moving to Eugene or I wouldn't have never done the Saturday market. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and you know, and it's, and it's fascinating that you're still doing the markets like that, you know, which is, I, I preach all the time on here. It's like, if you have a chance to go work the little farmer's market on a Sunday, just to get out there, to sell some pendants and some little hummingbirds that you're making, just something else that's not a pipe, because like you can't always sell pipes at the farmers market. You know, <laughs> it's going to give you a chance to yeah. learn how to market yourself and make things that are not pipes. Also, on top of it all. Well, and you know what? This is the crazy thing, Jason, is that for 30 years you couldn't sell on down at the. I mean, the Saturday market is on the courthouse block, so you couldn't sell for 30 years. Well. Four or five years ago, me and Dave Winship from Glasscraft went and lobbied, and we went to the board of directors, and with the Calabash story, actually Dave said, hey, Eli, I think if you come down there, I think we could pass this together. I went down there. We passed it. I, I had been selling glass there you know, for 15 years. I always wondered, like, okay, well, I can't make another hummingbird. I make armadillos. I do marbles. What else could I make to really make my business explode? down at the market once pipes got passed i started doing an average of four or five hundred dollars a day extra hell yeah for the last four years so you know kind of going back you know I, and this is about pipe town but we are i am in pipe town and, and you know our group is pipe town so the the deal is is that 
I made pipes in the beginning like crazy. And then I got away from them once I started learning from a Walt Disney class or Lewis Wilson and some other people more of this artistic stuff because I felt like there was a more of a niche market. And in my town, 6,000 glass blowers, I felt like it was saturated. And at the time when I first started doing glass, I wasn't thinking worldwide. I was thinking, okay, I got to sell a piece in my town. And so I'm not going to make pipes. Well, about five years later, I start making pipes again, but I don't sell them to stores. I only sell them at the Saturday market. Fascinating. Huh. So, yeah, and then I sell hummingbirds and octopus and all that kind of stuff as my main business all over the country, all over the world. And then it makes this really unique thing for me to still have that one thing in glass where I'm like, oh, I'm going to make this little unique pipe. What happened actually, once I started making pipes again, I started getting like ten to $50,000 in orders and I couldn't keep up on my hummingbirds. And all, all of these animals was just a little more more lucrative for me and, and less time in making it for the cost and, and all that all that stuff you do is in a business. But, mm-hmm. you know, going back to Pipe Town, um, I was really lucky to have Joaquin from Blazing Heart Productions because he could listen and, and we could collaborate together. And he had this, you know, I hate to say it, but it's like it was almost like two magical moments where we had some – because just like doing a collaboration in glass. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing, you, dude. Yeah. You never know what's going to turn out. Yeah. You know, so this was this was just something where you had two people that just really both hit the mark. And, you know, it, it's just a great film. Um, I could I could start kind of talking a little bit about the film as far as, you know, there's 16 glass blowers in it. It showcases the lifestyle of a glass blower in Eugene. Um their trials and tribulations from we've got Ham, Deline, Julie uh, Riggs, we've got H Bomb, we've got Bondu, Mike Philippot, uh, Corey Davy, and so there's a bunch of old school glass blowers, and then we have a bunch of young glass blowers that are in there, and it really showcases to know how the glass pipe got started and inspired here in Eugene with the story of Bob Snodgrass, and so. There's and and I know you've seen it and it's just yeah there's just a, a bunch of different elements through the whole film mm-hmm. that really do you know they're they're pretty impactful. Well, what I think is interesting too is that it's it comes from the perspective of Joaquin as a documentary interviewing the artists. So he he doesn't have a perspective of being in the scene. He has a perspective of an outside person with curiosity about the scene. So he's able to bring right. out some some stuff out of the you know interviewing the artists and sharing their stories that they may not share or say with another glass blower. I mean they might, but it's still they're they're asked, being asked questions that aren't the common maybe questions coming from someone like right. Joaquin, which I think is pretty rad, you know, and, and the traveling and just the style of the film too, the way it's done, you know, and, and it's it's interesting too to to seeing like you're saying with the evolution of the trials and tribulations where like early on. There was maybe like five of y'all making pipes in Eugene, so you guys had the market. Next thing you know, there's like a thousand, and then like you're saying, there's like a six thousand artist email list. That's eventually, <laughs> and you can't even sell your yeah. own glass within Eugene because it's so saturated. So then you got to go back to hitting the road again, like we used to do back in the day. You know, it's kind of this full circle in the cycle of the glass industry. And now we have trade shows, and but you still have to go hit the road. You still got to go travel around and hit right. the shops. So it's fast. Right. It's and fascinating. It, and it's, it's- yeah, it's that evolution, you know, yeah. the evolution of, of, our, of our glass life, like we, me and you and, and, you know, those guys that worked for Disney or the guys that just worked at the little malls and they did, you know, the, the, the stitch work and all that. Hey, we all know they all made a little pipe for themselves, some of them. I mean, they knew what pipes were and stuff, you know, but it was this guy, Bob Snodgrass, who started making those color changing pipes he was going to grateful dead he was inspiring that culture that was using marijuana and next thing you know um you know even guys like you could say lewis wilson and you know all these other guys we we know they had made pipes before you know we know they made pipes but they weren't the ones that really stood up like i said earlier with the torch and said hey and i don't think boss necessarily thought that either going back to you saying he was humble but he did pick up 
uh, uh, you know, that torch and, and run with it. And, and, and at, back in the 80s, imagine, the glass pipe was considered a meth pipe by authorities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was that's sketchy for him to do that in the 80s and 90s. I mean, he was risking a lot. So that's another reason. Like, he had balls. You know, he had balls that were like he was brave. And so somebody had to do that. And it's like that in any kind of industry that's when something illegal from moonshine to, you know, bootleggers, all that kind of stuff. There's those guys that kind of behind the scenes that are like, dude, this isn't right. Like, we're smoking marijuana. So, so yeah, it's great that, uh, you know, once again, uh, Joaquin, you're right. He's an outside source. He had six years of footage that he had shot of the glassing because he worked for Glasscraft. Right, right. And so he had all this footage. He had footage of Bob. And then, of course, we were going out to Las Vegas, and I brought him out there to the Glass Vegas show. And, um, you know, he, he was able to, to work for Glass Vegas. And, uh, you know, we told Glass Vegas, like, hey, we're going to come out and shoot Glass Vegas. They paid Joaquin, and we said, hey, we're going to use some of this footage, too, for our Snodgrass interview. So people, you know, I think that sometimes we do glass and, and we know, like, what it takes to make that. And you see guys like Banjo making a piece, and you're like, like me and you, we really know what it takes to make that. Yeah, you know? 100%. And, and, and this this film is just the same same kind of concept, the same thing as making like a piece that Banjo makes kind of like that. It's like, you know, the outside world, but that aren't glass blowers, they look at a Banjo piece, they not always, you know, these people really understand how complicated it is to make that. Yeah. All the so, things that can go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, yeah, totally. That's what I think you about. Know? Like, Oh my and God, so, all the things that could have gone wrong with that motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Could have cracked, could have, and, and and that goes back to like you know me and Joaquin working together. The miracle of it. Well, you know I've got to say one big huge thing. My brother Josh helped a lot on the film, and one of the one of the saints, you know, the angels that we had this for this film is a guy named Greg Lafrance. Yeah. And Lafrance Studios. He's he's out in Las Vegas, and he had you know the 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 same thing he knew that we had a really good story so he helped fund this story you know like i got with greg and said hey greg we've got a really good story here you know we'd, we'd love for you to be a part of it you you've you've obviously you know been in glass for the last five seven years i know his passion because i work with greg um and blow glass with him and i knew that greg would get behind us and so with those elements all together because you know something like this you can't do it all by yourself. No. Uh -uh. You know, so you have to work with people. You have to get along, you know, just like when you do a collaboration in glass. And so Pipe Town USA was really a, a just a great collaboration from four guys that really put their heart and soul into it that said, hey, we're not going to give up. Yeah, we had a lot of, you know, we had a lot of, you know, little, you know, you could say little semi fights or disagreements or whatever through this thing mm -hmm. and uh that's what it takes to make something really good yeah that's when you know everybody's passionate about a project is when everybody's got their that opinion and heads butt eventually it happens yeah hell yeah you know, it, so uh, go on. oh no go ahead well I, I was gonna say i think what's also fascinating with this is that you guys not only cover the history of eugene but you also cover the history of somewhat of the history of glass and going back to the italians and like the concepts, because like when Joaquin and I were talking, and, and I've talked about this with other people, like you know, Eugene's like the the mecca in America for glass blowing, and it's it seems like it's not it's not necessarily for glass blowing, it's for the pipe culture. Is like the, that's where the mecca is, you know, and it's where right. like maybe Washington could be like the mecca for glass or something. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's just right. Kind of, oh, it's, totally. You know, it's just kind of interesting to see it. But what I think is uh, for me the most fascinating is looking at the 20 years that I've been in this culture the 25 years ish that this culture has existed and that we have, we have enough stuff that's growth that I guess growth in a sense that has created history within this industry that we cannot document this stuff. And 
it's better to document it now instead of like a hundred years from now where all a lot of this information could potentially get lost. And, you know, the people that like Bob Stograss, he's not going to be around forever. So we got a ton of footage of him. We got a lot of him talking and sharing a story. And, you know, it's, 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 it's cool that you guys were able to do this with him and then share everybody, everybody else's story that's in there that are, you know, generational. Like I'm a second generation Snodgrass glassblower. And it's, I can say that, you know, yeah. Just yeah. in the just in the, the the Bob Snodgrass family tree, and I would love to see like, I think you maybe you and I had talked about this in the last interview, but to see like a true family tree of this culture, it would take forever to put together. But like you know, you could put a thousand people on a on a page that creates this arc, and Snotty's up there at the very top of this whole thing. Dude, you just came up with a great idea. You know, and that's that's uh, who knows? Like, this is a great idea. I could. I could make a uh, a tree for Snodgrass and have him write names down. I mean, let's get it from the guy yeah. and Hugh and Cameron and these guys who really know it. That would be a cool thing just to see and showcase that trickle effect and really do go back to this grassroots story, you know, and really even document a little bit more because Pipe Town USA, once again, an awesome film, but we didn't go in and dissect just Bob. You know, we didn't go in. We made this about all his stuff that he did and really also just about everybody else who was affected from it, like somebody that I didn't mention earlier, JBD, Jerome Baker, Jason Harris, who was part of the whole Operation Pipe Dreams, yeah. who made $4 million one year. You know, they, they, they pulled in $4 million. I mean, that was a direct result from snodgrass teaching somebody and so having the eugene glass school which i was a part of which i won a few times and i got second and third place through the years of the eugene glass school that also i pretty much you know owned by sahid and jason which was jerome baker you know right. so it was a huge one of the very first lamp working glass competitions and so when we talked about earlier series Pipe Town USA was originally to do this cool little, you know, documentary on Snodgrass and Eugene and all that. But, of course, at one time we said, dude, we can't get all of this information in one film. Like, this could be a series. And so guess what, Jason? I gave the I – got, I got really lucky. And I work with a company who sponsors one of the shows on Netflix, Blown Away. Mm-hmm. So we gave Pipe Town USA to the producer of Blown Away, and they love it. And so right now, I'm just waiting for, you know how media is and TV and radio and all that. It takes time. You know, it's, it's a slow process. And so right now, I'm just waiting for the next move. This thing's going to get on Netflix. And if it doesn't get on Netflix, you'll see it on Apple. You'll see it on Hulu. You'll see it on Amazon. Because it really is one of the first glass documentaries, and I know you've seen a lot of them, and so have I, but there's only a few that I've ever seen that could even make it to Netflix, and this is one of them. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, absolutely, and, and the so, length of it, too, is it's a good length, you know, and, and kind of going to the, to the blown away thing, like the... They could have done it differently, but the fact that they had that on Netflix as a competition for glass, period, is huge. And it's a huge step, you oh. know, in terms of laying a foundation for the glass culture to get recognition through a big media platform. Because I hear it all day at work, you know, people coming in, hey, that, that you know, but I, I can just cut them off because I know what they're <laughs> going to fucking say to me, you know. <laughs> and I, get, I give them my opinion about it, and then I just tell them, hey, I think the fact that you guys now have seen this, you've been exposed to this glass world, and it's caused interest. Again, you know, I can go back to Del Chihuly being a huge catalyst into bringing interest into glass into the into our culture and in America as a society in general and you know and the pipes being an offshoot of the subculture within the glass world and the cannabis community but it's still like this interest oh, yeah. for glass in general hence why you can go do a, a farmer's market and make a living selling what you're selling you know it's uh right you know and it's all it all stems yeah. from a couple different people out there and Bob Sawgrass being one of the influencers oh big time and so you know, going back to Pipe Town, USA, American shot, uh, the American shot glass, the contemporary shot glass. This was 
this was just a big project for me because, you know, once again, I write the book on why people don't make shot glasses anymore. It gets sponsored by Northstar for $10,000. We start a movement. We have all these people commissioned to make a glass to push the shot glass. And I find out about the machine, the machine in 1905, which is my next book. I'm just going to say this real quick. It makes 243 shot glasses, light bulbs, thermometers, beakers, milk bottles, ketchup bottles. You didn't package ketchup in a hand-blown bottle before the machine. And so what does that mean? That means this whole project all kind of played together for me because at one point I understood that, oh, okay, part of the reason that Bob Snodgrass was able to bring back the pipe in this niche market is because they never made a pipe machine. Mm -hmm. They made shot glass machine. They made milk, milk bottle machines. So nobody, of course, was going to make those anymore. Today, Jason, they make five million milk bottles an hour. That's they make crazy. five million light bulbs an hour. They make every single glass object five million an hour. They never made a pipe machine. It's why we have this niche market that we have this industry. Yep. So, and so this is all part of the project. It's in my next book. It's why Dale Chihuly existed. It's partially why Dale Chihuly could do what he did is because they made a machine it shut down the world of glass. Even over in Murano, they quit blowing glass for making all your prescription jugs. Your, you know, every container was stopped, and that's when Murano actually turned into this more of a touristy thing. Right. And um, yeah, and and so what I'm getting at is if if it wasn't for Dale Chihuly, since the machine shut down 300 glass shops just on the East Coast and in that area. Um, if it wasn't for Dale Chihuly bringing glass back to America, how did he bring it back? He showed people how to blow glass and started a movement again from the Italians to showcase this cool studio glass movement that was in the home. Well, in 1905 and all the way to really about the 1930s, there were still glass houses all over America. And uh, when Dale Chihuly brought it back, and uh, showed more of the art aspect of it mm -hmm. was a uh, was a real he's he's considered a national treasure and so without Dale Chihuly, um yeah I mean I said Bob might be the most influential glass artist of all time I I really put him right with or maybe just ahead of Dale Chihuly. that's that's my own personal opinion yeah no I completely agree because Chihuly brought exposed you know people to glass in art form in a sense and and started the whole the whole conversation of is glass a craft or an art, but then like Snotty right. comes in and and really finds and and, and and as a foundation for a subculture within the glass world. Hence, like this podcast. I know she started this podcast for the pipe industry, but then I found I love glass in general, so I want to talk about just glass in general and share you know other other types of glass art on here besides just the pipes. But it's all still. For me, uh, my foundation, I'm a piper at heart. I work uh, over at the Mouse House. I'm creating you know, characters in glass and doing what I'm doing, but I still come home and I still make pipes. Yeah, oh yeah, and it's it's all connected. You know, like, we're all connected, this whole glass thing. So, you know, a hundred years ago, that, that's a crazy thing, a hundred years ago, it was average and normal to have, like, the whole family blew glass. Right. That's what they did. The two brothers and the dad went to the glass shop every day and they blew glass. It was considered having a better job than, you know, uh, a, 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 a construction worker or a mill worker or a metal worker. Glass was this magical thing. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's just this super cool thing. And so a hundred years later, when me and my brothers started blowing glass, this is crazy, but it was three brothers, and I found out, I looked everywhere, and that was our marketing strategy back then. It wasn't like exactly what we made. We made some cool stuff, but we promoted it's three brothers that make glass because there wasn't a lot of families in America blowing glass together, yeah, exactly. and especially doing pipes. Yeah. And so when I say it's all part of the project, this machine shut down the history of glass blowing families blowing glass together. And a hundred years later, I find this unique thing that it's only, you know, it's this, we have this glass family that blows glass together. Yeah. It's because of the machine. It's shut down. And, it's, and so, yeah, the, the whole 
the whole thing that Snodgrass started was also, and he says it in Pipetown, USA, the secrets of glass. The secrets of glass have been exposed, and, and, and people are telling it, well, back in the day when they were even making the machine, what happened was they found out that the machine kept breaking down. This is a this is a Kiva Ford story that Kiva Ford told me this. So what was going on is that the machine was shutting down and they didn't know why. So they came in, they found out that glass blowers were throwing wrenches in the machine. Oh, interesting. And so, oh yeah, and so the machine kept breaking down, breaking down. I mean, you could imagine like if somebody made a pipe machine that was making 243 pipes every minute, and we were working there, we might throw a wrench in that machine yeah. too. Yeah, definitely. You know, and <laughs> yeah. so. That's exactly what happened. And so what happened, Jason, is when they – and this is going back to you know this conspiracy that me and you have talked about before – is that when they made the machine and they took over the glass industry, every single item in the world from a thermometer to a Petri dish to a lens to a light bulb to a radio bulb, a TV bulb, they also took and kept – and held back from us for a hundred years, the secrets of glass. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is cool. We're also learning all these secrets of glass and what it does. And what do me and, me and a guy like you do? We go out and we, we study the things that glass do and we bring them to people and they're amazed. They say, wow, I didn't know that the number one battery in the world was a glass battery. Right. But they're using them in the military and they have bacteria in the glass battery that just keep reforming and structuring and the, they multiply and you have this energy source. You're using it in naval ships. You're using it out at sea. It's the number one battery in the world. It's a glass battery. It's crazy. So the things that glass do that people don't know about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, while we're saying, we're saying, we're saying that earlier, I was thinking about like, the manufacturers and the the glass industry through the Midwest, like the Blinkos and the, you know those companies that made houseware and stuff, and Blinko became a household name through like the public television stations, and they were doing fundraisers and stuff for public television and share showcasing the industry that was Blinko and the manufacturers of of houseware. You know whether it was a collectible item or something you can you know cook out of. Corning comes along, they changed the glass industry in a sense in the manufacturing process, but then the pipe industry comes in and kind of revitalizes the glass scene and then expands it. And kind of saves the scientific side of things because these manufacture. I mean, they were making ma manufacturing raw materials anyways for the scientific community, but stuff that's machine made isn't necessarily going to be using a case of one inch heavy wall, you know. And there's right. thousands of pipe makers out there now that, for the last fifteen years ish or longer, have been helping support and supply the Kimballs and the Cymaxes and the, the Cornings and the Pyrex, you know, companies out there that manufacture. A lot of them now, are, unfortunately, are overseas. I get cut in costs and stuff for manufacturing. But still, it's also spawned these little sub-communities and sub-businesses of color, and you have two big brands that come out, and then a third brand, and then there's these wars and stories, which I've been doing a ton of research on. And then you have these little boutiques that come out, and now you have even more little boutique companies that are manufacturing amazing high quality heavily saturated color that it's it's just it's an, it's insane man <laughs> it's, to look yeah. back you know 20 years ago we had 12 colors and now we have like 400 plus colors we've had this palette that we've all dreamt about and we've seen the soft glass artists use for centuries that we now have access to and our glass all yeah. stem from this little pipe and it's fun to see like the gas conferences or the, the small glass community colleges or corning even allowing the pipe to become a demonstrated piece by an artist that comes in like salt you know or, or micah evans oh yeah and they've they've you know and 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 things all kind of collide together at the same time i sent corning pipe town usa um you know we we sent it to them a few months ago and of course yeah like you said they've been more open to um, you know, showcasing pipe makers and having a pipe in the museum. And then, of course, right after I gave them the film, they, of course, they did a story also on snot grass, you know, right away. And um, you could just see uh, everybody's opening up to the snot grass story. And so, 
just like the telephones created and this light bulb is created. You got eight people on the patent list. So it's it's been time to do the Snodgrass story for a long time. And the world is opening up to it. They're seeing more of really what this industry is about. You can go to pipetownusa.com. You can digitally download the film or you can order the film. And so that's one thing I know we didn't really have set up when you interviewed Joaquin. Yeah. But um, I'm glad you brought that but up. It, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's available. People can see it. They can learn about the industry. They can learn about the history of the industry and just kind of get this tidbit of information that I tell people, go grab some pot. Go grab some popcorn, some milk duds, and some juju bees, and just <laughs> sit down and watch this film because uh, it's it's definitely you know we've had a lot of lot a lot of great feedback and um, I mean even Neil Young viewed the film and loved it. Well, yeah, and that's you know, what I was gonna say, dude. Like for like myself, like I'm gonna show my kids this. My, I would, I've actually brought yeah. to my daughter's house several times and I keep forgetting to bring my DVD player because she doesn't have one since everything she has is all digital, you know, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but you know, it's for parents that uh, for those of us who are parents that are pipe makers or glass blowers, this is a great introduction to be like, Hey, this is why I do this, you know, to your kids. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you, you know, you're, you're right. And that, that's, 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 that's part of the film too, where it's, Hey, you know, I, I actually start crying because during that moment, and I could start crying right now because that's how passionate and that's how much I love glass. And of course it has to do with my family, but I raised my whole, you know, all my kids, three kids, my brother's four kids, my, my older brother, my mom, and, um, we've all lived a life financed by glass for the last 20 years. Every pair of shoes, every milkshake and cheeseburger and, Every single pencil, every single pair of shorts, a raft, a Barbie doll, everything that's been paid for in glass. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a blessing, isn't it? It's amazing. <laughs> it, 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 it's amazing. It's, it's a blessing. It's a gift. I feel grateful. And the cool thing about this film, for people that are listening, this is a story that we can all share together that's all of ours. It's not, it, you know, I don't consider it. You know, oh, this is this was ours or anything like that. This is a story, and that's why we had sixteen glass blowers in there, is because we wanted to make this about all of us. We wish we could have fit another fifty or a hundred glass blowers in there to tell the whole story. So let's anybody out there listening, let's get this film out there to somebody who can really see this thing and say, "Wow, like we need to get this out to the masses because this is a real American story." Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and and to 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 continue this the story as well to then continue a series in a sense of this and go across the country as as it like we said like with the family tree you know to see where it expanded you know yeah. going from there to to the west coast to the east coast to Florida yeah, and it's, it's uh it'd be really neat yeah to see. that's the dream you know the dream is uh, maybe Netflix or HBO or High Times who knows like maybe someone picks this up and says hey. Let's do a little mini series on this, you know. I mean, I think it would be more captivating than just about anything. Um, I research all kinds of stuff, and so all these cannabis documentaries that are already on Netflix, I haven't. I mean, I hate to say it, it's, and I'm not trying to be biased here because we made it, but I haven't seen one. Maybe just a couple that have to do with cannabis that are as good as this cannabis show. You know, and so, yeah, and I, and, and maybe that, maybe I'm stretching there a little bit, but it's, it's right up there with something that would be interesting. I mean, I wish there was, I mean, I, I like I said, I've seen a lot of cannabis shows. I, I haven't seen one yet that was just like on Netflix that was just, and, and, you know, because of the prohibition and stuff, because of every, the legalization, there's all kinds of cannabis shows being put up on Netflix all the time because it's a yeah. huge interest. It's, all people talk about, oh, legal weed, you know. So with that being said, we have a great, you know, we've got a great car to drive down the street. You know, we've got this thing that's a perfect timing for the the time that we're in. Yeah, I completely so, agree. I think those of us that got started, you know, even 10 years ago, really, 
and got our got our stuff sits you know situated fine tune our our techniques and crafts and whatever are in a pretty good position you know as long as you're willing to understand the side the business side of things you know within the, yeah. the glass world but you know the opportunity times are changing laws are changing i had luke zimmerman on recently he's talking about the way just some of these laws are changing and if you know people are filing copyrights and trademarks and stuff within the pipe world it's you know it's it's fascinating it's it's uh I don't know, man. It's good timing, I guess, in a sense, to, for, for us. Yeah, it's perfect timing. I mean, we're we're just we're like we like we said earlier, we're just super lucky. It's a blessing. We're grateful, and uh, we're living in a life of waking up and enjoying your life. You actually, once again, it says it in the film. We don't go to work to punch a time clock. We do this because we're having fun. Yeah, you know, cool hand sues and. Everybody and, and so there's once again so many different, um, you know, at, at, you know people saying stuff that just that attribute to the film that's things like this that we're talking about and they, and it just goes on and on. In fact, the first time I watched the film, I was like, yeah, that's good. I watched it again and I watched it again and I thought, and it absorbed. You know, wow, that really does have. A lot, and one thing that I like that Bon Du said, you know, most of these people that are making pipes, like me, when I first got started, the pipe passed around in a circle, and I saw the glass pipe, and I was like, oh my god, that is the coolest fucking thing. Where was this made? And so I had to know where was this pipe made, and so that brought me into glass, and um, yeah, it was just it, it started this huge you know, this dream, uh, sometimes pipe dreams do come true. And so I didn't have any artistic, uh, training or anything. My brother was a potter. My mom was an artist, but a lot of guys, they didn't have any artistic, uh, training. And so Bondu says they, these guys were picking themselves up from their bootstraps and going and trying to make, you know, something in art, something in glass, mm -hmm. you know? And so, they really did have to pick themselves up from their own bootstraps, and it just shows how strong some of these guys are um, getting what they want from just going out and working in the shop for 12 hours a day because they just love and enjoy the movement and the meditation, the, the soul-searching destination that glass gives you. Yeah, yeah, and the life lessons and... All that shit, you know. It's 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 always fun when people I talk to guests at work, and you know I get asked a lot like, "Where did I learn this at?" And I tell them my backyard, and they think I'm fucking crazy, but I'm like, "Yeah, for real," you know. And they're like, "Well, how'd you learn this?" I'm like, oh, "I learned by doing," you know. And I always refer to it like riding a bike, but you know, it's it is. It's yeah. You got to get on the bike, and you start off with training wheels, and eventually uh, you can ride with no hands, and you're jumping off, you know, curbs and stuff. And, and that that's yeah. hilarious. In my backyard, I'm gonna remember that <laughs> next time somebody asks me. You know, for years and years and years, my first ten years. I never told people really, they say, how did you get into glass? And I'd say, oh, my older brother taught me and da, da, da. And they ask me now and I tell them the truth. I say, you know what? I got into glass because I smoked a lot of pot. Yeah. I smoked a lot of pot and I saw somebody and I knew all my friends smoking pot would buy this pipe, you know? And so we don't want to go into, you know, uh, uh, a drug cast here because we start opening people's minds up with the drugs that you take. You know, the vehicle is the glass pipe for marijuana. And so some of these, obviously, as we know, uh, mushrooms, LSD, uh, you know, marijuana, they open up your pineal gland, they open up your third eye. And that's when you start to visualize and you start to see colors and you start to see, you know, you start to dream more intensely. Maybe something that was taken away from us on purpose. I don't know, but either way. Uh, that's a whole nother conversation, but um, I know that the people that do, you know, sometimes, you know, in this culture, they do expand their minds. So it's a, it's mm -hmm. a, it's an eye opening experience when you get into the pipe industry. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this, this and this film really does showcase not only the origins, but the expansion of knowledge and, you know, not being afraid to share things and, you know, I, th I think one one of my quotes that I love from the from the documentary you guys did was just the whole idea of, you know, you're not making glass, you're making glass makers. You know, and as a teacher, so, as we are, you know, it's uh, I think those that teach this stuff, not only are teaching 
the material, but they're teaching life life lessons, you know, along the way. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's nuts. Yeah, definitely. It's totally nuts. You yeah, learn man, it, so it, much, and I I tell people many times that uh, I tell people many times that I shaped the glass, and then it shaped me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. And it really did. Yeah, I think it's it fun, really man. Did. And I'm definitely uh, I'm definitely excited to get you back on here, like we talk pre-show and and, t- and talk about some stuff because there's there's a lot of topics that we touched on here that I want to expand upon, and one of them's being the whole, you know, early on as we got interested in glass was because we saw somebody with this crazy fucking looking crazy pipe, and it seems like as part of the issues with today's today's uh, generational gap that we have right now is with legalization of cannabis and a lot of people that are buying cannabis are going to dispensaries and they're buying a cheap ass pipe from the dispensary and they're not becoming knowledgeable and getting the origins of where this piece came from because the dispensary isn't really sharing this knowledge like we got back in the day when we go to our buddy's house and he'd have some glass he'd have some weed and he would share the story of the glass pipes that he had and, and maybe had a couple for sale and would tell us who the artist was and you know we got all this this knowledge then this knowledge isn't being continued and, and, and carried on as as it was so doing a, a film like you guys are doing uh, is really helping again to c- carry on this knowledge to a new generation because look at degenerate art degenerate art spawned an entire generation of pipe makers just got oh, all hyped time. up about it you know and so oh i think this documentary Unreal. is going to hype some people up but i think more than the hype i think what it is doing is it's just, it's giving you an education on where we all came from Right. And if you, I tell people, if you like degenerate art, you're going to love Pipe Town USA, yeah. you know, because once again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's something that, you know, uh, degenerate art didn't really all the way go really super deep into Bob. It showcased the heady movement and it was a platform for us. And so if, and that's why I said earlier, if there's anybody that listens to this can understand that the, after they watch this film, that we do have, I mean, there's so many things that are, like you said, going into buying Chinese pipes instead of ours. I mean, we've got the, the catalyst, the, the, you know, the, 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 the product to get to America to say, Hey, this is, this is the life of a glass blower. Like support these glass blowers, support the knowledge that goes behind this because We've all glass is like an onion. You peel it and you peel it and oh, I got another layer and then you peel it again. Oh, I got. There's so many things. People ask me, "Have you mastered glass?" I I do interviews here and there. Um, are you considered a master glass blower? What? I no way. I said, "There's so many things to learn about glass. You couldn't actually go to school and really give somebody a master's degree mm-hmm. because there's so many different things in glass." that it's what gives us technology it's what is like it's what gives us um you know to look a thousand years into the future it's what made religion it's what defied religion they, they say it was galileo it was actually the glass lens that defied the pope and so it was a glass maker that galileo would work with and yeah it's just it's it's all these cool things about glass that um, you know, really showcased in Pipe Town, USA, as a precursor for what we're talking about these these other stories that we could get into and write a whole movie on. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. So, yeah. and I mean, I know a lot of people they'll hear the excitement in my voice. I mean, it just comes naturally. Uh, you, it's it's almost like uh, I, I tell people it's kind of like when you get into glass, it's like putting a steroid into a bodybuilder and. I could flex and I could build muscle mass and I could pick things up and I could feel confident. The more I got into glass and the more I learned, it was a passional love thing. It was a soul searching thing. It was, I would find and connect with who I am and what I was here to do. And glass did that for me. Not everybody is lucky enough to really find that. And that's where you hear this passion coming from, Mm -hmm. from me, from you, from all kinds of glass artists who really have found their dream. Yeah, well said, man. And yeah, sometimes pipe dreams come true. Absolutely. So, Hell yeah. 
Yeah, um, um, I really appreciate you doing this interview. I know we've covered a lot, and, uh, you know, I just, I really appreciate it, and I'm, I'm glad that you uh, were able to do this, and just like the vehicle that you provide, and the more and more we can get your, you know, radio station out there. I know you've done a lot already, but the more and more, same thing, like Pipe Town USA, and that's why me and you hit it off so well, is that you've already been doing this for years and, and really telling people about the industry and about the things in glass and showcasing certain people who made glass and what they did. And me and you with the connection that we have, we're just another, I think, team. And, and we talked about this a year ago or two, you know, but not everything happens all at once. Yeah. I mean, they say it does, you know, uh, if you, if you, if you study Hinduism or Buddhism, right, but, right. Um, you know, yeah, either way. Um, I, I think that looking through the glass lens, uh, I can see me and you um, on some kind of, you know, some projects together about, you know, telling some stories and stuff. So yeah, dude, I completely agree. Again, just, just want to thank wise guys radio for sure. Hell yeah. Yeah. My pleasure, man. And uh, I'll make sure for everybody listening, I'll have all the links in the show notes where you can get the digital download or purchase this. Uh, I can get a physical copy of it. And you guys are going to Vegas uh, to do some uh, showcasing and premiering. Are you guys going to Las Vegas this year? Yeah, yeah. And you know what? I'm glad that you said that because I've had a booth at Las Vegas for years and years. I helped start Las Vegas. I was the guy that called the people who own Las Vegas and say, hey, we got to start a real glass show. And so I did Las Vegas for years. This year I wasn't going to do it. And then the, the, the film came out and I was like, I was always going to go to Las Vegas. I just wasn't actually going to get a booth because I just get too busy doing all this other stuff. And so Las Vegas is building uh, a theater with inside the show that's soundproof. They bought a popcorn machine and candy. They're running it on a 24 hour loop while the show's open. So you, every hour you can go in and watch uh pipe town USA. Hell yeah. And then uh, we're going to go on tour with this film. And so, We'll be showing it at places like Smitty Smoke Shop, and we'll show it at Melt. And I'm talking to the Michigan Glass Project right now, in fact. And so all a bunch of little spots that, that we'll kind of be touring around like a band and kind of showing this film at the biggest glass events and hoping hoping to get this film as, you know, something, let's say, like you're in Amsterdam and it's the biggest cannabis show in the world. I found a way that, oh, okay, maybe we could play this Pipe Town show at the, the cannabis event or maybe at the High Times event. What does that do? That gets all of the glass industry into, you know, that clientele that they can see the story. And so, once again, the, the story, the platform, and, and the promotions of this um, hopefully will bring the glass industry. And that's what we wanted to do, all of us, you know, bring the glass industry into every home in America of what we do. because. Every in, every other industry does that, but the glass industry is just starting to do it. So, yeah. so yeah, I'm really excited to go to Glass Vegas. I want to thank our sponsors. We had Lampwork Supply sponsor us at the Gold Level, Glass Vegas, East Coast Melt, and LaFrance Studios. And so, without all those guys, we we wouldn't have been able to do this. But uh, we, I just want to give a shout out to them, Lampwork Supply, Glass Vegas, and East Coast Melt, and LaFrance Studios, because. It just a just been a great sponsorship for us and, and, and gave us a backbone. Yeah, man. I'll make sure I'll put all their information, too, in the uh, show notes for everybody. Check them out. And give them right some on. follows on Instagram and what have you. Absolutely, brother. Well, cool, Jason. Yeah, man. Right on, man. Well, thanks again, dude. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the future and talking to you. Hell yeah, brother. Have a great night. All right. Bye-bye. Take care, man. Peace. Hope you guys enjoyed this conversation with Eli Maze. Definitely go check out all the links I have in the show notes. Go to pipetownusa.com. Uh, for further information on this documentary, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's very fascinating. Whether you're a pipe maker, uh, interested in glass, a glass artist, whatever you know you want to call yourself, uh, and you're in this glass world, I definitely highly recommend this documentary. So thanks again to all the sponsors, everybody that was on here, and we'll talk to y'all soon. Love you so much. Take it easy. See you.